guys. We're good to go. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Greg. I'm giving a talk today on Linux IoT botnet wars and the lack of security hardening. Just a fun slide to get us started. It'll encompass a very important part of our talk. <laughs> um, so my name's Greg. I'm currently working on an interesting project called Mender.io. It's an over-the-air updater for Linux embedded uh, devices, fully open source, and we're using the dual AB uh, rootfs layout scheme, uh, currently under active development. Um, so my, my original talk was supposed to be 45 minutes, and I originally included uh, three botnets, but I'm going to talk about Mariah, which was very popular. Uh, in the media because it was a very large-scale attack. I'll skip over Hajima. I might mention a bit about it, and then I'll talk about BrickerBot. Um, all three of these botnets had some very common security problems. Uh, they were targeting IoT devices with very common and similar security problems. We'll talk about that. And finally, we'll look into solution designs of how we could have mitigated uh, these problems. Um, this is my first FOSDEM. I wasn't sure about target audience. I'm pretty sure all of you guys know what this are. Uh, but if anyone's unfamiliar, DDoS is um, essentially distributed denial of service, traditionally used to overwhelm a system um, and prevent it from working correctly. You have IoT. Um, I was buying a heater recently, and it connected to Wi-Fi. Um, basically, billions of devices now are connecting to the Internet. Uh, botnets, um, I'm sure everyone knows what this is, but just in case, um, they're used to carry out uh, distributed attacks. I might be using malware, worm, botnet interchangeably, but this is the definition. So I'm just going to look into the basic anatomy of an attack uh, that you tend to see. Um, so you have the reconnaissance, which is you're going to discover a vulnerability, and you're going to find a way to exploit it. You need an intrusion method to get that initial access into a system followed by inserting a back door. You want to do this in case you get found out and you want to be persistent uh, in reinstalling your um, worm or bot on the device. Finally, you need to avoid detection somehow. Uh, most um, worms, botnets, uh, malware figure out a way to prevent the user from understanding that it exists in the system. So I'm going to talk a lot about Mariah because it's um, the most popular IoT uh, botnet that caused quite a bit of damage, and um, a lot of um, in interesting research has been done on this botnet. Um, so it was discovered in August 2016 by a group called Malware Must Die that did a pretty nice analysis on it. Uh, one of their honeypots, honeypots detected it. Um, Mariah means future uh, in Japanese, which is very scary if the IoT industry is going to follow this uh, idea. Um, and it infected, um, the numbers are pretty skewed. Um, so there was some estimates around 200, 300 thousands, but some variants of Mariah have targeted around 1 million devices. So you can take these uh, numbers as a grain of salt. Um, it's quite a skewed uh, range of numbers that um, were infected, but a lot uh, were infected. Uh, the type of devices that were infected is, this is a good example. Um, in one of the source code, um, they actually mention model numbers and models of uh, specific um, IoT devices that were targeted. This one right over here I found on AliExpress selling for $62. Uh, a lot of the, the Lua devices were specifically targeted. Um, so the DDoS that were carried out by the Mariah botnet were extremely large scale. Uh, we'll look at uh, Krebs, of, Krebs on security. If you're not familiar about Krebs on security, he's a very popular um, blogger that writes a lot about uh, malware, DDoS attacks. Um, when this bot was discovered, he wrote a, um, a really long blog post uh, describing um, the, the botnet and also was able to find out with very good confidence who the authors of this botnet was. Uh, in response, a, f a couple of days later, they DDoS them with 600 gigabits per second. Um, what's really interesting is that Akamai was hosting his website already um, because he was re um, oftenly targeted with DDoS attacks. And it was the largest DDoS attack Akamai ever witnessed. And what they did is they actually pulled a plug on his blog, but uh, Google Project Shield stepped in and said, uh, we'll host your blog from now on. They have computing technology, a CDN that they promised to um, prevent DDoS attacks or are able to hold against them. Next is OVH. They were targeted with one terabit per second DDoS attack. 
Um, what's crazy about OVH was when I was doing the research for this talk is uh, they get DDoS around 1,200 times a day, uh, which is crazy. And uh, the DDoS attack that stood out by far was this DDoS attack. Um, we'll talk more of why they were targeted. Next was DynaDNS. Um, they provide DNS hosting solutions for all the major IT companies. Um, I remember specifically uh, one evening when I was trying to browse Reddit and the pages stopped loading, restarted my router, ran dig to see what was going on and DNS uh, resolution was failing. The next day I found out that one of the largest DDoS attacks ever was performed against uh, DynaDNS. Um, so the malware has um, an update, update functionality where they could, uh, they were able to uh, add new functionality to their uh, botnet. Um, it was only using DDoS attacks. It uh, used around six different methods of carrying out the DDoS attack. And for some reason, the authors of uh, Mariah decided it was a good reason to share their botnet source code online. Um, the authors of uh, Mariah were pretty interesting people. Uh, they thought that maybe if they would share the source code online that um, they would kind of uh, reflect responsibility onto others. So um, the way the Mariah botnet works is uh, very primitive. Um, you'll see a lot of things here are very primitive. Um, so what it does is it just scans the internet uh, looking for port 23 or port 2323, which is just plain text telnet. Uh, it attempts to brute force uh, login with 10 uh, random usernames from a hard list of uh, 62. So if it determines that it could contain, it can connect to this IoT device, uh, here we're connecting to a uh, digital video camera, uh, and it determines that you could log in with admin admin, it'll talk back to its report server and let it know that this IP address, uh, you could log in with admin admin. Next. The loader program. I find this quite interesting. Keep in mind that IoT products are running a whole bunch of different architectures. Um, so when you connect a via telnet to one of these devices, you're not sure if it's MIPS, uh, you're not sure if it's ARM, and what variant of ARM it is. Um, so via telnet, you have to detect uh, what kind of architecture this device is running. Uh, and then one out of the eight downloaders or loaders of the botnet will be installed onto this uh, device and install the Mariah. Uh, botnet and infect the device. Uh, it uses some pretty basic obfuscation, uh, nothing um, new, randomizing the process name so it's harder to figure out uh, if something weird is going on in your device. It deletes its own executable uh, so it doesn't survive reboots, but that's not a problem. Uh, in the first 72 hours, I believe 11,000 devices um, were infected and these numbers were doubling every hour. Um, so when you have that big of a botnet being reinfected happens very quickly. And most IoT devices don't get rebooted that often to begin with. Uh, it deleted or removed competitive services. So um, Telnet was disabled, SSH was disabled, so you wouldn't be able to gain access to the device once it was infected. Then it just continues being a botnet, connects to its command and control server, and listens to who it'll attack next. And of course, it just continues scanning for more victims and growing the botnet. Um, so a quick recap, it targets a whole bunch of IT, IoT Linux uh, embedded devices. Around 30 vendors were targeted, but um, a lot of vendors just uh, don't, a lot of vendors have multiple devices, um, so it's not only limited to 30 different devices. Um, so it was very efficient at um, spreading via brute force over Telnet, and it scanned the whole internet. Um, something interesting that the authors um, thought to do was um, not scan uh, Department of Defense in the US, the US Postal Service, and uh, other American entities. For some reason, they thought if they didn't scan these guys, maybe we won't get the attention of the authorities, but then they carried out the largest DDoS attack ever. So, yeah. um, And of course, it uses an extremely primitive attack vector, username, password, and you know all these IoT devices all have very um, simple um, combinations. Um, so, in, I'm going to just talk about the motive, which is also very interesting. Um, the motive behind Mariah uh, was money and Minecraft. Uh, while reading about Mariah, I learned that uh, if you run a Minecraft server, 
uh, you can make up to uh, 100,000 US dollars a month somehow. Um, and these guys had a pretty cool business idea. So what they did is they set up a company and promised DDoS proof Minecraft hosting and in order to get people to come to their uh, hosting platform and host Minecraft servers, they DDoS everyone. Uh, <laughs> uh, so that's specifically why they attacked OVH. OVH is one of the largest um, hosting companies that hosts uh, Minecraft servers. And they thought that if they attacked DynaDNS, um, they would somehow bring a bunch of Minecraft servers down and everyone would come to their uh, hosting company and they'll make a lot of money. Um, of course, that resulted in uh, their arrests because the, there was a pretty um, big attack and uh, they used no OPSEC and uh, wrote all kinds of things on uh, hacker form online, uh, which is crazy. Um, so they caused the largest internet outage in recent history and the largest DDoS attack ever recorded. Uh, one variant of Mariah was capable of infecting 900,000 Dutch telecom modems. And of course, it highlights a new threat. Uh, uh, trivial is, or the, you're used to seeing botnets infect servers or desktop computers, uh, but now you're seeing that these Linux devices that are connected to the internet that are being infected. And if the future is going to have billions of them, something has to be done. So BrickerBot, uh, everything here is in the name. I'm sure you could figure it out what it does. Uh, so it was discovered in March 2016. The author said he was really inspired by uh, Mariah. Uh, <laughs> and very recently, in the end of December, he wrote a uh, update to his manifesto saying that his project was over. He claims to have bricked 10 million devices uh, using his uh, botnet uh, and wrote a um, rant that um, IoT security is non-existent and um, to prove it he destroyed a whole bunch of devices. Uh, so he carried out the permanent denial of service which essentially bricks your device. Um, I'm not sure if you could see um, those commands on the right hand side but essentially um, what the bot did was once it connected it just destroyed your device by running random data to the memory. Uh, and secondary storage, and then deleting the route to the internet, and then rebooting your device. So essentially, you're left with a brick. Again, um, very trivial, a trivial um, attack vector, scanning the internet for port 23. It also used um, other techniques, but same idea, brute forcing uh, Telnet, SSH, and HTTP authentication. Something that was interesting is this uh, author actually used a zero day that was eventually found out that affected some modems. And like I said earlier, uh, basically deletes everything, disable your network, reboot, brick. Um, one thing that's very interesting is, um, so since this botnet destroys your device, you don't really have a botnet. What you have is uh, a central attacking uh, command center. Um, and the way this worked is it was around an estimated 10 IPs uh, that were hiding behind uh, Tor exit nodes uh, that were scanning the internet, uh, looking for devices, and bricking them. So there was really not a botnet here. Uh, so the author wrote the manifesto. He updated it and had more things to say very recently in the end of December of 2017. So you could see what he says here. Large attacks would force the industry to finally get its act together. Again, um, should have mentioned this earlier, but it's mostly busy, bo busy box uh, Linux devices, SSH, Telnet, hiding behind 10 IPs, um, cannot spread because it bricks, and uh, username password. Um, in India, uh, there were uh, 60,000 modems that were actually bricked because of um, this bot and um, one of its uh, zero days, I believe. So a summary of the botnets, I skipped out on Hajime, but I'll give you guys a chance to read this very quickly and I'll give you a quick summary of how Hajime was somewhere like Miraya and somewhere like BrickBots, BrickerBot somewhere in the middle. So Hajima was very much like Mariah, but um, it didn't brick uh, devices. Uh, like BrickerBot and Mariah, it didn't brick devices. All it did was connect to devices and um, get rid of um, Telnet and basically get rid of Mariah's oxygen supply. 
Um, there was no attack code in any of the reverse engineering of Hajima, and uh, it's um, centralized. It, it wasn't uh, decent. It wasn't centralized. It was decentralized in nature, which was very interesting. So the author of this botnet actually created a fully uh, decentralized botnet uh, using BitTorrent uh, protocols. So he used a distributed hash table to talk to all the bots, and he used um, UTP, UDP over TCP for. Um, Trade, uh, transferring data amongst this botnet. Uh, he's never pulled out an attack. He claims to be a vigilante that's trying to just kill Mariah's oxygen supply by killing Telnet. So very interesting uh, botnets happening in the IoT uh, world. So why are IoT uh, devices targeted? Um, so the embedded world apparently has this ship it, forget it mindset where once you ship your device, uh, you basically basically forget about it. Uh, ease of use, coolness of a product is always uh, cooler for some people and lacking security is a side effect of this. So some people don't want to think <laughs> of what their default credentials are and just try admin, admin, and too lazy to look at a manual or need your device to figure out what the randomly generated <laughs> credentials are. And finally, um, a lot of these devices were extremely cheap, unbranded, and sold by some random companies. Uh, if you're selling uh, very cheap DVR equipment for $62, and you have no idea who the company is, there's no real identity to protect. Uh, finally, they make great targets. They're sold in very large numbers, and they're all identical. Find a vulnerability in one, you own them all. <coughs> so again, um, you could see that the attack vectors were uh, similar. Uh, another interesting thing is as soon as you log in, you get a root uh, login shell. So you could do whatever you want. So how do we get device manufacturers to actually um, create devices that aren't uh, so easily hackable? Uh, we're looking at um, vulnerabilities that we've seen in 1990s. This is like a Windows machine or Windows 1998. Uh, there's no security in any of these products. Um, and everything could have been remedied very simply. Uh, device manufacturers should be held accountable. This is not always easy because um, if your device manufacturer is somewhere in China and you know nothing about who's actually manufacturing device, it's not easy to bring them to court and say your IoT uh, botnet caused all this damage. Um, one good idea is that the IoT uh, Cybersecurity Improvement Act um, is hopefully coming, so we have a major player, U.S. government, that's trying to pass some legislation. Um, what they want to do is uh, have a bill uh, that has some basic uh, principles that you have to follow when designing an IoT device, like being able to update it, uh, signed artifacts, and whatnot. So in case you find a vulnerability in it or there's a design flaw, you can easily fix uh, the problem by shipping an update. Or maybe we need more bricker bots that just destroy all the devices that are easily hacked. Um, so as we looked at uh, the anatomy of the uh, typical attack, you'll see here that uh, reconnaissance was just distributed in fast port scanning and looking for especially Telnet. Some of these botnets leveraged other things like SSH, but Telnet was uh, the most successful attack. Uh, intrusion, uh, very basic, using a password list. And um, some of them used an exploit. One of them was a CWMP exploit. That is some routing, routing protocol I'm not really familiar with that had um, some remote code uh, execution that they were able to leverage and uh, gain access to the device. Um, inserting the backdoor just requires um, detecting the environment, downloading and running the binary. Um, one thing that I didn't mention earlier is the way they detect the environment that you're running on. You have to figure out if you're running ARM or MIPS or whatnot. Um, I believe Hajima's method was pretty interesting. What it did is it looked at um, the first few bytes of uh, the echo command, and using that, it was able to determine what architecture uh, this system was built for, and then download uh, the loader. Finally, uh, process name obfuscation and removing binaries, uh, very typical things that uh, uh, viruses and malware do. Um, fixing these problems was, again, easy. Uh, these devices were listening to Telnet and SSH on your public interface. Uh, you probably don't have to do that. You could probably just close these ports and have some other way of accessing these, these devices. Um, next, 
Uh, for the last decade, if you look at a modem or a router, some of them usually come with a random generated password, so uh, you don't just guess admin admin to gain access. And finally, uh, principle of least privilege, uh, you don't have to give someone a root shell uh, with uh, default credentials and they can carry out anything they could want to do. Um, I'm going to quickly talk a little bit about an over-the-air updater. Uh, which is possible to mitigate all these uh, problems. So essentially, if you have an, um, uh, an IoT device out in the market and you find out that either your design is bad or a new vulnerability is found and your devices are all hackable, you need some sort of mechanism to update uh, your device. There's quite a few um, update mechanisms, Mender being one of them, uh, and you would be able to address all these issues by just um, updating uh, the device and getting rid of this design flaw or vulnerability. And over there, the updater means that essentially uh, it's not the user that's taking care of the update process. It could be managed remotely. So some of these devices that were attacked uh, were very much like the firmware updating that you do in your router. You log into a panel, go to a website, download a firmware, and manually pick and update the firmware. So you're just uh, passing the burden onto the user. Um, and one thing you have to keep in mind when downloading a uh, over-the-air update tool is um, it's not always easy to make a homebrew one um, and leave it up to another company um, so they can take care of design like what happens if you get power loss during an update process. You don't want to be like a breaker bot and destroy your device. Uh, you want some way of being atomic and do some sort of automated rollback if the firmware uh, update fails. Then, of course, uh, you don't want to be able to do any sort of man-in-the-middle attack and modify the firmware uh, while you're passing it over and updating your device. So you need, of course, crypto. And finally, you want to make sure that the owner of the device uh, are the ones that are supplying the updates. Uh, so not anyone could flash your device with any uh, mal uh, firmware they, w they want. Um, this is the last slide. Um, not much, just something to think about. Um, I'm open to questions. No, no questions? We have no. a few more minutes, so we can take a few questions. Yeah, if you have any questions about my slides, please. If you have questions about OTA updaters like Mender, feel free. I just wonder if any of these buttons are targeting devices on IPv6. Because I noted that if I put a device on IPv6 networks, I don't see any scans. Mm -hmm. That's a uh, that's a good question. question for oh yeah, sorry, sorry. So the question was if devices um, work if a device is connected via IPv6. Um, I don't recall seeing anything specifically about this, but if I'm going to guess, I mean with IPv6 IPv6 adoption rate, what is it right now? Like 20% less, then your attack vector would be reduced significantly. Mm -hmm. But it would be, of course, nice to have as an advantage. But um, I'm not sure about that. Yep. Have you, you mentioned closing, default closing ports um, and the reaching it some other way. Can you like expand a little bit on that? So um, I know, s oh yeah, sorry, sorry, keep, sorry. Uh, if there was a way to uh, not open a port on your public interface and uh, use some other way of connecting to it. Um, I know some uh, D-Link, I think it's D-Link or some other manufacturer has some URL that you could use to connect to, to connect to your device, like some sort of reverse HTTP proxy where they allow you to connect to the device by not directly connecting to the interface. That's one technique used. I'm not sure if that's the best idea, but some routers have this kind of technology. But it, it is a hard problem to solve as well. Question over here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, are you aware of any attacks where, I mean, not standard, like guessing a password uh, attacks have been have been used apart from the ones you, you mentioned? How, how likely is it that yeah. these things happen? So the question was, uh, besides the telnet and brute forcing, uh, what other attacks were used? Um, so m the most successful attack was the default uh, telnet. SSH was also pretty good, and HTTP. Um, but I mentioned earlier in one of my slides uh, a routing protocol. Uh, that some of these routers were using that had a zero day that was being leveraged uh, in Brickerbot. Uh, so the author knew of some zero day um, 
used it and Checkpoint quickly found out that BrickerBot was using something that hasn't been disclosed before. So it's not only Telnet, but Telnet was very successful and extremely primitive.